All right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the very first Veg Networking meeting of 2021. Happy New Year to everybody. Today, we have a new member spotlight uh, with a business owner and entrepreneur who makes coffee with a conscience, making quality, eco-friendly coffee in 100% compostable bags from his family farm in Costa Rica and roasted in Canada. He is a son, husband, and father, dog lover, former pilot, and as previously mentioned, a Costa Rica coffee farm owner. Ladies and gentlemen, help us welcome Yaroslav Yaro Yassel. That's quite the introduction. Thank you. <laughs> Hopefully I can live up to that. <laughs> <laughs> we are so happy to have you here. Um, your brand has uh, been, been booming in a time that I'm sure was, was tough and you didn't really see what the light at the end of the tunnel looked like. And so we're very happy to have you here. And we're going to jump right in with our first question of eight, our conversation starter, which is, Yaro, what is your plant-based vegan origin story? Sure. Yeah. So basically our journey for plant-based and vegan food kind of came for searching for a healthier diet and lifestyle. So as you mentioned, I'm a pilot. And so we spend a lot of time on the road, 15, 16 days out of the month. So we're always eating in hotel rooms or bringing leftover meals with us. So you can imagine that's not the healthiest kind of living that you can have. And so that's kind of what started me and my wife, Heather, down the path of researching. And so on one of my flights home, I watched the Game Changers. That's, that's I'm sure everyone has seen, but that kind of gave me uh, the last piece of motivation I needed to jump with both feet in and kind of uh, give this a go and see if this will work for us and our lifestyle. And uh, yeah, we're kind of lucky we did because I enjoy eating and food a lot more now than I have before just because of the complexity and uh, meal prep and all the spices and herbs and that, that is used. I'm actually enjoying food kind of almost in a new way than I have been before. So um, our, our kind of personal like um, retirement plan, if you will, is to go sailing. And so we've always kind of been eco-conscious and eco-friendly and the, the vegan diet kind of completed that circle for us. And uh, yeah, we're happy we made that choice. From flying planes to sailing ships, eh? <laughs> yeah, from fast to the ultra slow. That's kind of, <laughs> Once you're retired, you're not in a rush. <laughs> Amen to that. Um, great. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, so it sounds like a fairly recently um, full-on switch into the, into the plant-based vegan lifestyle, which is, which is wonderful. We all wish you the best. I know that some of us here have been over 15 years and so. And so, uh, yeah, bright roads ahead. Um, now, when it comes to your business in Vito Coffee, um, what is the origin story behind that? Or was there a previous entrepreneurial origin story and this is maybe your second business or how did that unfold for you? Uh, no, this is our first business. So this is kind of why it, it all kind of came together as we became, became plant-based and then vegan. Um, when we were planning to import and sell our coffee in Canada, this is where we kind of started figure out what our brand is going to look like and how is that going to fit into our uh, personal life and philosophy. And this is where the compostable packaging element came in because back to the sailing part, there's a lot of waste generated by the coffee industry. So we didn't want to pollute the oceans that we hope to one day sail in uh, by contributing more plastic waste. So as we started learning about the plant-based and vegan lifestyle, then we started researching what other options are there for packaging um, what other brands are doing. And so that started down our path for researching for coffee. Um, there's very little available. So even the manufacturers that we're using now, they're constantly pushing and adapting um, the possibilities of what it is. But um, yeah, so the branding kind of stemmed from our personal beliefs wanting to go sustainable. And the third kind of um, thing that kind of, made it one circle that this is the right path that we're on is that Costa Rica is 99% sustainable and they were going to be carbon neutral uh, 2021, but COVID delayed that till 2030. But we wanted to represent the coffee and the 
and the heritage of where the coffee comes from in our branding in Canada. So being plant-based, finding the packaging and also supporting Costa Rica and representing it to its, our best kind of uh, possibility kind of created in Vito Coffee. And that's why we wanted to launch as the first zero waste coffee brand because everything we do from the ground up is with the zero waste um, philosophy. And so, yeah, that's kind of where we are now and how we're hoping to expand further. Wow. So the, the sort of the plant-based personal and then the entrepreneurial story, those origin stories are kind of tied together. And, and for exactly. Reason. Wonderful. Wonderful. Now, forgive me for not knowing this already, but what is, if there is any um, history or, or uh, meaning behind the name Invito? So Invito, uh, because the coffee is from our family farm, we wanted to kind of bring people into our family. So invito means to invite or invitation in Spanish, also in Greek. So uh, that was kind of the play on words that we wanted to. So we want to invite you to try our coffee, to visit our plantation. We actually offer uh, tours that you can come and see how the coffee is grown, how it's processed. And we launched that last January, right before kind of COVID hit. So uh, we haven't fully evolved that aspect of our kind of tour side we want to expand further we want to build a few um like eco eco huts like mini hotel kind of where you can come and stay because at the farm if you this is kind of the escape from like city life where it's super calm you have butterflies birds like it's its own little like symphony and so it's a really nice like away or getaway from the busy lives that we <laughs> all lead so that's kind of, yeah. That sounds incredible. And I know that my brother has a affinity for Costa Rica when he went there. And uh, in looking through your social media, somehow you guys are connected. So we'll just talk about that offline if you guys actually know each other or not. But I found that interesting. Sure. So, yeah, I, me and my brother, Brandon, I'm sure we definitely gear up to go to those yurts or those little hotels and have a stay right. on a coffee farm. That sounds amazing. Um, so this next question um, kind of dovetails into what you already mentioned, I think, about the packaging. And the reason I say that is because we've had special guests on recently who are talking about trends in their industry. And one of those trends that has uh, constantly come up is eco-friendly packaging. Mm -hmm. And so the third question that we have here for you is what are some trends in your industry? So the trends, the main ones is called third wave coffee, where you now, so it went from the commercial coffee in the 60s and popularizing espresso-based drinks and kind of the on-the-go, and then the Starbucks came in, which kind of built the coffee culture as it is now. And then third wave coffee came in where we're now focusing on flavor. And this is where the part of the packaging industry came in to preserve as much of that flavor and deliver people the most flavorful coffee, uh, regardless of what happen after because it's most people consume a bag of coffee in two to three weeks so that's the that's the lifespan of a bag that's now going to sit in the landfill for a thousand years um so the second the, the latest trend is fourth wave coffee which is kind of what we're involved with and that's going right to the farmer so working with the farmer trying to develop sustainable and eco-friendly ways of farming um and so a lot of roasters or brokers are wanting to work directly with the farm. So we eliminate all these pieces. So we're literally farm to cup. So even at our farmer's markets, I'm brewing you your cup that I, that the coffee has been grown on our farm. So it's like very few companies are able to offer that level of transparency um, and owning that supply chain, especially with COVID, like, uh, I'm hearing a lot of horror stories with other companies not able to source certain things, uh, ingredients, packaging, et cetera. Um, so we can provide that stability if businesses are looking to work with us because we have the coffee. Um, and I imported in Vancouver and we roasted fresh small batch every single week. So that is the trend that's coming now, the fourth wave coffee, but the trend is also the packaging. Um, people are so like it was a chicken egg situation. Manufacturers wouldn't produce it because no one was buying it because no one kind of, kind of, it wasn't the, the, there the demand. yet. Yeah. yeah. And so now the manufacturers are seeing there's a demand. They're pushing technology like at a rapid pace. Um, 
and that's kind of where in three to five years, I think compostable sustainable packaging is going to start to become the norm and the petroleum based packaging will be out the door. So um, we're hoping to just be ahead of that and compostable packaging is three times the price, but we wanted to build our company from the ground up with that philosophy in mind and future proofing our business because if companies or, ro or coffee companies can't afford that packaging in the future, uh, then their business model might be in jeopardy. So we wanted to kind of future-proof ourselves and this packaging becomes more cheaper than everyone kind of wins. Absolutely. Well, you heard it here, coffee lovers. Uh, the trend is fourth wave coffee and uh, that's a pretty powerful statement that you mentioned about enjoying a bag of coffee for two to three weeks mm -hmm. um, and then sitting in a landfill for a thousand years. So uh, possibly also a trend in consumer behavior in what mm -hmm. our eyeballs are gravitating and looking towards on packaging to make educated decisions. Yeah. That's uh, very, very powerful. Um, Okay, so you mentioned uh, your unique sort of almost like a sanctuary at the, at the coffee mm -hmm. farm that's, that's in the future. But aside from that, where is Invito Coffee going in the future? So the ideal positioning that we would love to be is the go-to coffee for zero waste and uh, plant-based vegan kind of, we want to be at the forefront of that. So like, that's why we're pushing technology. We're trying to adapt as quickly as we can and set up all these processes. Uh, so whenever you think zero waste or sustainability, my goal is for you to think in Vito Coffee. And so our goal for 2021 is to build more wholesale accounts. The challenge of like, we launched last March in 2020, right when everything started. So we've been battling uphill ever since. But the businesses that were already in play, like we didn't have much overhead, which we were very fortunate, but uh, we're trying to partner with now existing businesses that are still a little bit shell-shocked and they're not ready to make decisions or take on new products or change vendors. Um, so that's our challenge for 21 to build these partnerships uh, because we're not just a coffee company. We're trying to change people's behavior, bring in sustainability, um, we're big on social media. We, we can offer that to companies as well versus some brokers that just sell you the coffee and forget about you kind of thing. But we want to build a culture, which we're, that's where we're very fortunate to be part of this vegan community because it's such a strong and vibrant culture that, uh, I didn't really foresee starting in Vito. And as we became vegan, um, I didn't realize how strong the community is. So that's kind of very fortunate that. Uh, there is such a support group. Yeah, very strong community. I know that my introduction into Invito was I just put out a, a question out there and Zoe said, you have to try Invito. Mm. And, and the next day I'm at uh, Dry Digger Farms buying Invito coffee. Right. So that's right. a very, very tight knit, very powerful community for sure. Um, okay, so let me preface this next one by stating that you, in your mission and vision, you're already supporting like the best charitable cause there is, which is Mother Earth and the environment. Mm -hmm. That aside, are there any other charitable organizations that you are supporting or look to support in the future? Yeah, we're, we're going to want to work with uh, Ocean Legacy. Um, they're a Vancouver-based uh, charity, so Ocean Cleanup and those kind of initiatives. Uh, so 2020 was very challenging for us, so we weren't able to focus too much efforts in that direction. But in 2021, that's kind of where we want to expand. Um, join some uh, ocean cleanup initiatives again COVID's delaying a lot of these things so but that's kind of where we want to go this year makes total sense everything that you've been stating so far is in like near 100 percent alignment um, very very thoughtful um, and it just gets my creative brain going thinking about all the different partnerships you could develop with mm -hmm. people who are in the sailing community because that is as well another tight-knit community um, okay so as an entrepreneur and business owner um, and spending a lot of time um, as a pilot going from here to there, I'm assuming that you had some books, podcasts, or apps that you really, <laughs> really gravitated towards. Is that safe to say? Very most, uh, yeah, very, very accurate. So uh, I guess the first books that I kind of, or my dad made me read was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Just that, yes. that's what set me on to the entrepreneurial thinking and mindset. Um, I mean, in the air, you have four or five hours to think and chat and kind of develop ideas. So that's why over the years, I'm like, what do I want to do other than being a pilot? And so 
I, I made it to the airlines, so that kind of checked off my career goal ambitions. And then I'm kind of a type A, really go-getter type of individual, so I can't just sit there and twiddle my thumbs for the next 20 years. <laughs> so that's where my brain kind of got thinking. Um, and then, of course, I read all the uh, um, Richard Branson, Elon Musk. Just I love understanding human psychology and how people think and, and what makes certain people successful and others not. And so a lot of psychology I like reading about. And that's kind of where my brain gravitates to. Yeah. And for anybody who may not love reading and enjoys audiobooks, I must say that's the way that I consumed uh, and completed Richard Fordad myself was through audiobook. And mm -hmm. surprisingly, it's quite, um, you wouldn't think so, but at least I found it was quite um, descriptive and like you, mm -hmm. you could really, you could really like picture what was going on as the audiobook was going through. So right. very, very worthwhile um, book to consume, whether that's through reading or audiobook. I, Totally agree with you on that. Uh, thank you, thank you, Yaro. Um, okay, so last two here. Um, are there any companies, whether local or abroad, that you love to follow and support that we might not know about? The fortunate part about being in farmers markets is that you're meeting companies similar in our position, like all those smaller startups, the visionaries that are also trying to do something unique. Um, so I'm not sure which companies you're not aware of yet because it's such a small community, but uh, plant-based we're very good friends with now. Uh, Simply Delicious, they're always at the markets. Um, Scratch Foods, Scratch Fine Foods, I think they're called. Um, and there's lots of vegan bakeries that I've kind of been trading coffees with at the market and trying everyone's uh, goods out. So that's just, the, that's the exciting part is just for us to, really learn which companies are out there because when we started being vegan we really didn't know what was available and it's just now eye-opening how much there is um so i look forward to meeting everyone at the group eventually and learning about everyone else's businesses as well and just kind of building our network yeah and that echoes consumer behavior like we talked about uh earlier on and for those who do feel comfortable right now uh to venture to the farmers markets you know what you're saying is true. There's, there's a lot of exciting new visionaries and uh, businesses and products popping up. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're fortunate enough to be near one of these amazing farmers markets and they're, and they're open and you feel comfortable, I think uh, definitely worthwhile to uh, get out there and, and connect uh, in a time where uh, people are really um, isolated and needing to connect and, and what, a, what a safe, wonderful way to do that. Okay, now prefacing it by saying we are definitely asking for it. Every time we ask this question, people say, well, I don't know if I'm in a position to answer that. Mm -hmm. So it's always prefaced by saying we are definitely asking. And if you don't have any, that's totally fine. But yep. what is, if any, your advice for any business owners or entrepreneurs who either on the call now or listening mm -hmm. on the replay? I'll just speak from my experience of what I feel is working for us. And uh, that's like niching down. Like when we started being plant-based and vegan um when we were, were developing our brand be like well do we want to push that philosophy in our consumers do they care like are they gonna be discouraged or frightened away that we're like vegan because that like years ago that's like a little bit of a taboo word if you said it like you're vegan oh like you know so but that fear is like an irrational fear where if you niche down and you really talk to the people that you want to talk to, they're out there and they'll find you. Um, so instead of trying to catch the whole Vancouver coffee market, we're vegan. We want to find zero waste, vegan, sustainably conscious consumers and work with businesses who have the same philosophy. And that's really what I found has worked for us. That's how we are growing. Um, and, I feel very fortunate for that, but I feel part of that is our niche down, super micro orientated approach. Um, and of course the coffee's good. <laughs> so that's the most important part. But other than there's a lot of good coffee in Vancouver, it's how do you win over those customers? And what are they looking for? And is there anything op available in today's marketplace? And the answer that we found is no. Um, 
people are searching for sustainable options and coffee is unfortunately one that's lagging right now. So that's why I hope to position ourselves as one of the leading companies that are pushing that and people can confidently turn to and feel that they're we're transparent and we're zero waste and people feel good about that. Absolutely wonderful advice uh, for any business owners and entrepreneurs in terms of, uh, you know, who are you and what do you want to attract mm -hmm. and what's your value and surround yourself with those types of people and sort of the whole false evidence appearing real, the whole irrational fear that you mentioned, you can kind of put that by the wayside. So I think the more that people hear that type of advice and that type of messaging, I think people are really going to in intuitively be happier because they're doing what they want to do. And so uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so th those are the, the, um, conversation starters that we have one through eight. And as we always do with our, our special guests and new members, we always uh, end our conversation with leaving the floor open to you. If there's anything that uh, we missed, anything special that you would like to mention, please, you have the floor. No, I think your introduction kind of covered everything that we're trying to accomplish. Uh, but I just want to, yeah, kind of, again, feel fortunate that we ran across Helen. I think your uh, channel and Instagram, I think I've been following the same with it. Uh, Facebook so um, I was pleasantly surprised that you're also part of this group um, and then yeah I just looking forward to meeting all the other entrepreneurs so like I was saying in 21 we're looking for uh, business partnerships because that's kind of our next growth plan so uh, hopefully everyone can benefit each other um, and that's where I want to leave our story <laughs> absolutely well ladies and gentlemen i am admittedly a coffee addict uh in Vito does deliver for sure uh, i think some other hands went up as coffee addicts as well so if you haven't had a chance uh, to be invited to try and Vito coffee make sure that you uh, get yourself that invitation and get yourself a, a fresh cup um, and for anybody who's looking for zero waste coffee think in Vito coffee you can find them on instagram at in Vito coffee that is I-N-V-I-T-O coffee at Invito coffee and same on the web www.invitocoffee.com. Thank you, Yaro. It was a pleasure speaking with you today and welcome to the Thank group. Thank you very much. Yaro, why don't you let us know sort of where are some of the retail stockists where we can pick up Invito? Sure. So on an Instagram, I saved all the stories uh, where all, all our retailers are. Uh, so I guess I'll start with uh, City Avenue Market carries us in all their three locations, Commercial, Port Moody, and New West. Also in New West, we have the Refill Stop. Uh, they're a zero-waste uh, kind of boutique store. So they're, they've been our second retailer that picked us up. So we're very fortunate. And it was right in the middle of COVID, so they took a chance on us. Uh, Muckabouts Gift Gallery, they're on Hastings and Burnaby. They were our first retailer, and we're still working with them today. Um, and then where are we? Um, Lee's Market in Fort Langley. <laughs> and then we are local, local supply in Abbotsford as well. I might have missed a couple, but we have 10 locations now. Um, but they're all saved on our website as well as on our Instagram. And we do free home delivery. So if someone can get out there or is uh, locked down with COVID, we do delivery as well. I know for myself, when you were, when I was listening to the conversation, I think to myself that I'm doing good at zero, as being close to zero waste as possible because I don't buy coffee out. I make it at home, but then I forget that the bag goes into the garbage, like you said. And actually in our house, my husband drinks like three to five cups a day. Mm. So, um, he loves, he's Greek. He loves that giant lavazza and, he, oh, yeah. and it literally is gone within a week. Mm. And, that giant bag just into the garbage every time. I never really thought about it because I'm thinking in my head, you know, no cup mm -hmm. lids, no straws, but what happens at home seems to be a completely different mindset. And um, I think, yeah, I really need to look into sort of more um, packaging at the grocery store. Is mm -hmm. that step where you have to be really conscious and sort of breaking habits and just sort of grabbing and running because you want to spend as little time in the grocery store as possible so right. i find that i'm not really sourcing new products or you know looking for these things on the shelves because I, I want to get out as quickly as possible so it's mm -hmm. falling back on those old habits during covid well and this is where we kind of launched our free home delivery right away 
because people were locked down and we were a brand new company with zero customers and how do we reach people when everyone's sitting at home? Um, so that is the first thing we did and we're still doing that and people are really appreciative of that. Um, and then this last fall, we launched our Invito Loop program, which is refillable mason jars with coffee. So it's the bringing back the old milkman model, if you will, where I deliver a jar of coffee, you use it, you leave your jar outside and I swap them out based on your subscription or your order frequency. Um, and that's completely zero waste and you don't even have to go to the grocery store. <laughs> so that's kind of our initiatives that we're launching to help people and make it easier for them because yeah, there's so many barriers out there right now that many people don't know where to start or where to make the switch. Um, and so that's kind of our approach where you can be zero waste without sacrificing coffee quality. And that's where a lot of people might be kind of afraid. We're like, Oh, if I keep it in a Mason jar, the quality will degrade or I'll have to buy worse beans or so that's kind of where we're evolving. And so with our loop program, we're hoping to build a network of having these refilleries at all of our retail locations. So past COVID, hopefully you can bring a jar to any of our retailers and ref and fill it up or just swap them out. And so that's our global vision that we hope to achieve. I'm curious about the process of buying your own. How does one go about buying a coffee farm in Costa Rica? Like that is a hugely different way of thinking when you're like, I'm going to go to coffee distribution and, you know, and roasting and stuff, but then going and actually buying the property. That is a huge undertaking for a first time entrepreneur. So that's why it's a family farm. So my dad's also an entrepreneur and that's his side of uh, what he does. And so he has a business partner and they were able to acquire the property, but they also didn't, don't, didn't know anything about coffee at the time. And so that's where I got plugged into. <laughs> so it's a Mount Everest of information that I had to learn and overcome and kind of in a short amount of time. So we, uh, the farm was a little bit of neglect. And so we, we replant, so it's a hundred acre farm. So we replanted almost half of it with new trees. And so that took two to three years of work because the trees take uh, about three years to grow to start producing their first crop. And so that's why it's taken us, the farm's been in the family for five years. So we've brought it, our coffee into Canada last year. So it's taken us four years to bring everything up to quality where we felt comfortable introducing it to the North American market. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's a new project for, for me, especially as a pilot, I've never really done coffee, but it's a, it's a rabbit hole I'm happy to have fallen into because it just opens up your eyes. I was also a normal Starbucks drinker in my whole flying career, but as you learn something, you, now you can't unknow something. So once I learned about specialty coffee and what good coffee can actually taste like, it changes your life, so. I'd be remiss if I didn't say, and uh, you know, I haven't vetted the other side of what I read, but I'm a believer in it so far, which is, and maybe Yaro, you, you know something more than I do, but um, when making your coffee at home, it is worthwhile to do it in such a fashion that does have a filter, sort of like a pour over or something like that. Because I remember pretty recently reading an article about if you consume your coffee without a type of filter, that there's a lot of oils that are actually negative for human heart health. Do you know anything about that? It depends on the roast. So again, so the, the you're correct. The paper filter filters out the oil. So if you're having a French press, for example, you'll have a different flavor. So say you're even using our medium roast, which is not oily at all. Um, and you make it as a pour over versus a French press, you're going to have a slightly different extraction because the oils add flavor. The more you roast coffee, essentially what you're doing is you're burning it. So it's like baking bread. Once the bread's done and it's flavorful, if you keep baking, it's going to start burning. And so the coffee culture, um, I'm not going to knock Starbucks because they have done a lot of positivity for the industry, but the coffee culture that they have developed is the dark roast um, coffee that we know now. You put a lot of sugar because it's not really pal palatable. And that's where the negative side effects come. So the more you roast, now you're become, now it's becoming a piece of charcoal. So, and so now you're, it's no longer good organic matter. It's a piece of coal. And so those are the things that now are not as maybe healthy for you. I can't speak for heart health as I haven't done that amount of research into it, 
Um, but that's why we keep our roast on the lighter side because lighter coffee is actually more good for you. It's got more antioxidants. Um, and that's why even our espresso roast, it's a lighter espresso roast because it gives it the complexity. Um, it gives it the boldness that most people are used to in a dark roast, but we leave a little bit of citrus in there because it, it, it layers the coffee. You don't get that burning or those burnt notes that you get in a darker roast. And that's kind of also the education piece that I'm kind of hoping to change people's or open people's eyes that coffee should be drank black because you want to experience the flavors of where that coffee came from. That's the whole reason we're doing what we're doing. We want to bring you a flavorful coffee and eat even coffees from our own region have slightly different characteristics and flavor because of the soil that they're growing in. And that's the fun part of trying different coffees. You're, it's like you're in a candy store, you can try a new flavor of coffee every single day if you want to, which makes Vancouver a phenomenal place uh, to have coffee in such a rich coffee culture. Um, but that's kind of where I try to educate people. The dark roast isn't necessarily good. It's just what you're used to. Totally. One of my favorite experiences with coffee was uh, in Ethiopia where they get the, mm -hmm. they roast the green bean right into, and it's like a whole like ritual. It takes like an hour. Yeah. You know, if you refuse it, it's rude. <laughs> it was a really, really cool experience. Um, so yeah, I, I could imagine how uh, just different regions and soil would uh, mm -hmm. factor in. Um, if I may, I would like to use the whole acres and acreage conversation and maybe divert over to Desiree. If you, I'm sure everybody's seen what's going on with you, but is there anything you want to share? Haha, <laughs> we bought a farm. <laughs> um, super fun. Uh, five acres in Maple Ridge, and we're going to be leaning on anyone I know that grows plants and flowers and organic ingredients to grow on the farm. Um, but I'm super interested in Yarrow because I, my main job is I'm building a brand of seaweed food products made from seaweed that were grown on Vancouver Island. And on my mind right now is sourcing sustainable packaging. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm learning a lot about sustainable packaging and how it can be compostable, but then there's PLA in it, which yeah. means it's not compostable and, uh, or it needs like a heavy duty, you know, yeah. compost, like industrial type of uh, machinery. So mm -hmm. anyways, um, yeah, I would love to know where you've been able to source your packaging from. And if you have any uh, leads or companies, maybe you could share um, to pass along my way. We're looking at snack, snack products right now. So mm -hmm. seaweed, seaweed jerky, the seaweed um, snacks, that are already in, in the marketplace, but none that come from Canada. They're all from Asia. Um, mm. And then some other products as well. So in, in terms of like partnership and stuff like that, we're definitely looking towards, you know, partnering with other companies in the food space that are sustainable. Mm. We're not zero waste, but not, like hearing you talk about that, I'm like, wow, mm. that definitely should be something that we should be striving to achieve. So yeah, I really appreciate I mean it's you. super yeah so like i'll tell you the company it's elevate packaging they're in the states um i i put a bunch of stuff on our website as well for just the general consumer to understand kind of what we're trying to accomplish but yeah they're in my research they're kind of leading the pack in compostable packaging they just came up with a compostable coffee valve so their plastic isn't pla it's a wood cellulose so it is still a um, plant-based material and it's not using petroleum. Um, they explain it much better on their website than I can do justice, but they're, in my opinion, leading. Everyone else is doing either hybrids of materials um, or, yeah, they don't have, like for us, it's coffee. It's, it's a little bit more challenging with the barrier and keeping coffee fresh a little bit longer if we're putting it in retail stores. So that's our challenge. Um, we also don't want our coffee sitting for six months in a grocery store. So that's kind of where we're balancing. If certain grocery stores don't work for us, then that's not the grocery store for us because our goal is to fresh. We're farm to cup and we want to keep it fresh. So the high barrier bags isn't exactly what we're looking for because they have a lot more layers of laminates. Um, so that's our, our shelf life kind of requirements. But then you have the whole city discussion and where can you compost these things and that's kind of the debate that I don't really tell our consumers about because it's like 
they haven't done the research to really understand what it, a lot of people think biodegradable is compostable. So it's like, that's where we put stuff on our website so they can understand a little bit more that what compostable actually is. Um, but like city, for example, the city turns their compost every two, two months versus three months that is needed for compostable packaging. So that is kind of where we're a little bit ahead of the pack where our packaging is compostable and it will compost even in the landfill just a lot slower than if it was put in a proper city compost um yeah i phoned the city i'm like can i put my bags they're like no i'm like why but it's, it's all profit for them because they want to turn and move the compost in two months versus three so that's the other battle that at some point politics, yeah. well that's exactly that's the politics that i i hate that it has to kind of coexist but that's unfortunately profit sometimes over the right yeah. thing so so is it almost better to be using like fully recycled material and have a recyclable package it versus... depends on the laminates used so like for example a coffee bag cannot go in soft plastic because there's too many laminates used and it cannot even be recycled so people who want to do the right thing there's no there's nothing that exists so with our packaging it can be recycled it can be composted but officially the city doesn't actually want it so that's our challenge is like yet yeah exactly there's not enough people yet complaining about this so yeah it, it's funny it makes me think about like walking down the grocery aisle i don't know maybe like five years you know they have them yeah. now it's like a section in the grocery aisle where it's like organic right yeah. makes me think about in five years walking down the aisle and it's like mm -hmm. zero waste yeah Right, and it's all these different things. We got Desiree's coming. We got Yaros. We got all these different things yep. going on. Um, because well. even the vegan space, like talking to some uh, uh, retail stores, like the Cisco's and all those, there's such a high demand for plant-based food right now that they're they can't even keep up. Like they're so behind the eight ball that, like this movement is moving that much faster than a lot of people are re realizing that. Yeah, in three, five years, the landscape is going to be completely different. Helen, you might want to uh, send a, a, a little note to Dean from Tomorrow Foods mm -hmm. and say, hey, ch check in mm -hmm. at uh, minute number 37, because this is exactly what Dean was asking from Tomorrow Foods, Yaro. He was talking about uh, compostable, zero yeah. waste type packaging for their business. So this would be an awesome mm -hmm. thing for him to listen to at that point. Shauna, Mike? But yeah, anyone about compostable packaging, yeah, just shoot me an email or however uh, the preferred method of communication is within the group. <laughs> uh, yeah. Because the more people are on this and the more interest there is, I think the, more, the faster this will definitely move. And... I'm one of the rare ones that actually isn't a coffee drinker. That's okay. Uh, well, I mean, I... <laughs> I'd like, I've had a few people give me cups of coffee or espresso or something. You have to try this. I oh, it's okay. But I'd certainly like to try it. And um, I have your website now. And um, one thing I do, I'm going to put an order through for uh, the, um, what is it? We have a good Nothing. decaf. If it's the caffeine that you're not, can't tolerate, or is it just oh. the flavor? It's, I just never developed taste for it. Mm. So I never drank it when I was young. And then, and then there's a point where do I develop a habit now where I'm going to Starbucks twice a day? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, then but, start uh, with our start with our medium roast because then that'll. Yeah. Well, what I'm going to do? I'm going to buy one of the sample packs. Oh, uh, yeah. And what I what I'm going to do? Well, maybe I'll buy two of them. I'll try one. I don't even know how to make coffee really, but um, <laughs> but I'm my uh, I have a dog rescue. So what I like to do is um um promote veganism and. Mm -hmm. uh, environmentalism but through subtly and this is one mm -hmm. way i can do it we're introduced yeah. to people products and people so i was actually mm. um it's quite fascinating listening to this and uh you know i went to buy i buy a lot of soaps and detergents and everything at a zero waste actually not entirely zero waste but a store soap dispensary on main street and there's a seven day waiting list to uh to pick up wow usually the demand that people have for bringing back mm -hmm you know, zero waste. So hopefully this just keeps going and going and we're, you know, progressing.
Well, that's why we were surprised with our loop program with our refillable jars. I wasn't sure if it was going to flop or people would even use it, but actually people are starting to use it and they really like it, especially with our delivery. It's like super easy for them. And yeah, that's kind of exciting. It's effortless. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. no, good for you. Good work. Yeah, thank you. So Mike, did I see a whole new batch of puppies coming up from Puerto Vallarta? You did. I, um, it's December. Yeah. So, and I'm supposed to be headed back in one month today, bring back five more. And um, it's tough with the flights being canceled and the quarantines and uh, now the COVID test before you return, which is, I can do, that's fine. But um, no one's traveling. So it's just me traveling, quarantine, booking another flight and going. But um, it's getting the dogs here, whatever it takes to get them here. How are you funny? Like I noticed that um, in my neighborhood, um, people seem to be buying a lot of dogs. There are brand new breed puppies everywhere. And I'm wondering how we can help get the word out because I do occasionally see on my Facebook page, people will pop up and just say, oh, I have a friend who's looking for a dog. I really want them to adopt instead of buying one, but we can't find any. Mm -hmm. So how, how do we, um, get that information to people that there are dogs that maybe not be as easy, but they're, you know, they're still buying them on Craigslist and waiting for them to be shipped. So it's, it's really the same yeah. process. <clears throat> and that's unfortunate because people want a dog, especially during COVID times, they want something right now. And for us, um, we tell people we've kind of halted adoptions, but we still, there's friends and there's existing adopters that want another dog. So, okay. So it kind of fills up our, are um, is on the planes but um a lot of people just want to stick with us they say we want to adopt through you and we'll be patient what it's six months eight months end of the year and the way i can do that is just through stories on social media and show the impact of the rescue show the impact they have on the families here the adoptions and people see that i i don't know how else to do it rather than it's my way of telling people how rewarding it is and what you're doing for this animal and keeping people from buying dogs from backyard breeders. And I'm, I'm noticing now that there is miniature Huskies and it's just like almost toy size in, in uh, down the street for me. And it's just, it's unbelievable how yeah. we've gone from taking these, these dogs and just completely manipulating them down to something that's suitable as a product. Yeah, it's awful the way they, you know, you take two dogs that shouldn't mix even size wise there's just no way but somehow they uh manipulate them to where they uh, you know force them to do you have a list um besides yours your rescue um of other um dog rescues that um like three or four or five of them that basically we could share with the group for us to make a facebook post just so that people have a selection in case they they contact one and not find what they're looking for basically and if we can do sort of like a referral around to our mailing list yeah i could do that because i definitely um send people it's not all about me i'm happy to send people to other rescues as long as they that i respect and um i'd rather adopt through someone else than, uh, than buy and one of the common uh, e emails I get is um, from rescuing dogs that have already been adopted here or purchased here. We purchased from a breeder. It's not the dog we wanted. The dog is aggressive or something. We want to give them up. Can you take them? And they're giving up so easily on these dogs that they purchased. So that's... Anytime you can throw up that hashtag, adopt, don't shop. Yeah, exactly. And um, yeah. Yeah. So just do stories and uh, just do promoting and and that's why I kind of want to put the coffee out there because it's something it's a way subtly I can promote uh, you know zero waste and um, yeah, it's my way of doing things. It's powerful, Mike. I, ta I talked about it before. I mentioned Zoe uh, earlier on the call, and I remember reaching out to Zoe and just have, I was like, "What do you think about like animal activism mixed with plant-based food, like vegan activism mixed with plant-based food?" And I remember she said um, something like, oh, I don't know if people, like, if they're seeing these things about the industry, if they would have the appetite and the stomach to eat food at the same time kind of thing. And I was like, oh, I don't know. Like, I think, I think that there's a lot of power in being able to do that, uh, whether it's through coffee or food or what have you. And 
for any vegan, which is all of you, if you've ever heard of Joey Carbstrong, he's been doing that type of activism often now where he's actually giving away plant-based burgers while showing what happens in, in the industry. And he's even being like, this is insane. He's like, I didn't know it would work. But the shift that people have of like, oh my gosh, I'm eating this. It's delicious. It's cruelty free. And I can have this while avoiding that, like no brainer. So Mike, yeah. I think, I think that you're right. Like that subtle way of uh, showing people that they're missing nothing is, exactly. uh, is powerful. And we, you know, we are a dog rescue, but I also point out that, you know, we rescue a duck, some chickens and um, birds and cats. They may not come here for adoption, but they, it's not just about, it's about animals. It's not mm -hmm. just dogs. We're not just selling dogs. And it's, it's about all animals. So I, those are important stories too. And the families that take these animals into their homes and care for them, just to show the, you know, compassion. Be right. Michael, how do your adoption fees compare to SPCA and the other rescues in the Lower Mainland? We, uh, SPCA, I'm not sure. They might be a bit cheaper. I mean, their funding efforts are, you know, quite, am, quite amazing, but um, we are a bit cheaper, if not on par. And I do that to not, I mean, regardless, it's way cheaper, half price than buying a dog usually. Um, right now they're 500, we had to raise them only because the costs to get them here are more. And we've added microchipping and we do, we go above and beyond for vaccinations. So, but it's still actually quite a good price for um, but I want to encourage people to, um, there is a value, of course, we don't want to make it too cheap, but, uh, but you want to encourage people to adopt rather than to buy. Well, from what I understand, um, and this started years ago with the, um, the SPCA, and I'm pretty sure they haven't stopped because it's too lucrative. Um, when they do have the designer dogs and the smaller the dogs, they have waiting lists and they basically, oh. it's like WestJet, you know, the, the, the more demand there is, the higher the cost. Of course. Yeah. If you're looking for those, you know, adorable under 25 pounds, suitable for every condo, um, years ago, the prices for those were seven, eight, nine hundred dollars They'd be like, yeah. we have three of these available from this litter, and this is the cost. And then there would be a waiting list, whereas the larger mixed breeds and stuff were very affordable. So it was like, they do um, jack up the price for the more that they anticipate that that breed is going to be um, desired by the public. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't do that. I just, as it's like, you know, through ethics and uh, yeah. we, do so discount, uh, yeah. we do discount some senior dogs. Uh, we don't, and sometimes we do it after the adoption. We don't actually tell the adopters because we want them to sincerely adopt, not caring what it costs. Mm -hmm. But we will say um, it's half the price or, and a lot of times people come back with donations to make it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but I don't want to, yeah, you don't want to jack up prices on it because some dogs, it's incredible how much applications you get. It's all about finding the right person, the right family, matching the dog for us, matching the families with the dogs. I, w I was saddened this week in my um, memories that popped up from when I was in Greece over uh, 10 years ago. Um, one of the women at the shelter put up a post and it was this dog, Elsa, who looks a lot like our Snickers when she was younger. And I said, oh, you're, you're putting up a memory with Elsa. And she was like, yes, she's still waiting for adoption. And this dog is like 12 years old now and she has been at the shelter her whole life. And she's all old and arthritic with a gray muzzle and, and she looks like Snickers. And I just thought, oh my God, I had no idea. We virtually adopted her for a couple of years when we came back. Uh -huh we hit hard times, we had to stop um, all the adoption, the virtual adoptions that we were funding. And, um, and I had lost track of her. And I just assumed that she had gone to a home, but she has been outside, you know, in Greek, the heat in the summers to the freezing cold in the winters her whole life. And I just, uh -huh. uh, my, my heart just went out to them. I'm just like, you still have dogs from when I was there. And that was over 10 years ago. And there's uh -huh. this country, you know, they, they did jump on the adopt, don't shop, but still certain dogs that weren't breed dogs or small enough are just, you know, just languish in these old cages or tied to trees. And I just, the, you know, the love for senior dogs is just so hard. I would love to fly her over and have her here, but she probably wouldn't survive the flight at this point. So I did put a, 
it did take a couple of Greek friends when I shared that, but um, it is very unlikely that she will find a home. Unlikely. Donna, Edder, we, we haven't heard from you. Boost up the morale. <laughs> that was very sad. Uh, <laughs> maybe Shauna and then Edder, uh, if you don't know Yarrow, just say hey and tell them a little bit more about what you do. Hi, Yarrow. Um, it's nice to see you again. <laughs> So I actually just bought the last bag of your coffee that we had here at Plant Life. Nice. Um, so I do need to order more. Okay, perfect. <laughs> and I want to try the decaf too, because yeah, sometimes the caffeine is a bit much for mm -hmm. me. Um, but yeah, it was great hearing your story. And when we first um, started carrying your coffee here, I didn't realize that you were vegan. So that is great. Yeah, it's kind of like there's a lot of stories to tell, so that's kind of yeah. <laughs> one that sometimes I miss to mention, but yeah, well, and it is fairly recent for us. We've been vegan for a year and a half, so it's kind of all, sometimes not as natural yeah. to say right away, but yeah. Well, we, all know, the, we yeah. all know the joke, right? How do you know someone's vegan? They tell you in the first 30 <laughs> seconds. <off. Right. laughs> that's usually how you do you know there's a pilot in the room. That's the <laughs> same idea. <laughs> it's such a great feeling like finishing a bag and then like knowing like putting it in the compost so I love the packaging um the retail locations like could we sell it from the mason jars and then have people drop yeah. off the one and I can give them a new one yeah exactly yeah so like that's the challenge with businesses some are not comfortable doing that kind of bulk kind of sales right now so that's what yeah you were on my list that I did want to mention that too. So yeah, I'll, we'll, I'll send you a message later. Great. Thank you. <laughs> and just as an intro to Edder, it makes me think uh, what Shauna just said, because Edder's in the film production business. What Shauna just described made me think as a consumer, if I could see a video mm -hmm. explaining the empowerment of being able to recycle your coffee bag and how like from yeah just like being able to tell that story there's probably so much amazing stuff that you have idea wise for your business for video but anyway Edder go for it <laughs> yeah I mean I, I'd like to second that I, I truly believe video is a powerful tool in marketing mm -hmm. like especially the time we're living now not only COVID but like being in the 21st century mm -hmm. having like a video playing device in our hands the whole time and it's it's just very powerful. Um, I just like want to deviate a little bit from Yaros because I, I'm getting to know Mike today as well. I haven't met Mike before. And like part of my activism as like uh, using my skills and it's to create content for, for causes that I believe. Uh, my puppy is right here beside me. He's a rescue. And I mean, I'm passionate about dogs and passionate about rescuing, like adopting, not shopping it. And like you were talking about ways to promote and you, you mentioned like stories, like empowerment stories, like stories of like uh, success, successful cases of like, you know, adopting a dog. And in my mind, I was thinking like, if you know, if you, if you know a family on the top of your mind, if you need to do some research, then you think we could do like a video, like a short documentary kind of thing to tell the story, like the success story of that family bringing in a rescue dog and how he helped the dog, how he helped the family. Maybe we can work on something together to help your business and to promote the idea of adopting. Like that, mm -hmm. that's something that I would like to do it very much. So uh, oh, reach out for me after like, let's talk about it. Like I would like yeah. to do that very much as part yeah, of my to. activism. Yeah. So, and we have families that would love to do it. They love to tell their stories too. That's great. Let's do it. And um, Yaros, I'll probably reach out for you too, because uh, I mean, it's weird to say that I'm in the early stages of my business. I've, I've been I've been with my business for over a year right now, mm -hmm. like because there was a pandemic in the middle. I don't count the last nine months, so I feel <laughs> like I'm in the first semesters too. Um, and part of my business is like to to build a portfolio. And I want to work with stuff that I like, stuff that I feel passionate. And when Justin mentioned, like, few people raised their hand to say they're addicted to coffee, I was this person. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't have anything coffee related in my portfolio. I have a lot of stuff food related because it's something that I love to shoot. Uh, I don't have anything coffee related. 
So you have, if you have anything in mind, also let's let's. Yeah, that's maybe. perfect because we've been looking for someone to tell a farm to cup kind of story because that's kind of the strongest element of our business that I, I've been so much focusing on the zero waste aspect because that was such a challenge to overcome and to implement. But the farm to cup story, I haven't had a chance to really, other than the farmer's market, I kind of, that's our best way to engage with customers is I can tell them right away and because we don't have a cafe or anything. Um, but yeah, through video, I completely like, uh, as a hobby, I was doing a YouTube channel for my pilot piloting. Uh, so I know how valuable video can be. And so, yeah, I definitely want to do more video and that's, yeah, part of my 21. So that's, let's do that too. Yeah, let's, let's talk. Um, I got to bounce. I'm sure everybody does as well too. Edder, thank you for sending me the invite to like your Facebook page. I just did it. And then I realized I went on about a dog, Helen's page, Synergy Nutrition, Plant Knife, Cascadia, and now Invito. And I, I talk to you guys every week, but I wasn't even liking your pages on Facebook. So <laughs> I've liked all your shit. Uh, let's keep doing that for everybody else. Uh, have, a, have a lovely day and I'll talk to you guys all soon. All right. Bye. Thank you. So it is two o'clock. Um, does anybody have any questions that they want to ask other members or a story to share before we go? No. <laughs> I, I did want to ask Desiree about this. We bought a farm. Who is we? And sort of what was the impetus behind buying a farm? Uh, it's a long story. So let's talk afterwards. But it's more just personal. It's uh, investment, that kind of thing. Lots of moving parts with everything that's happened in the last six to eight months. So. Yeah. Cool. Okay. See you, buddy. Next Thursday, one o'clock. Nice to see you guys. Thanks, Helen. Nice to meet everybody. Okay. See you later. Bye. Bye.